Hi, everyone. It's Kristen Hawkins. Welcome to this new episode of the Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. As you know, we're in season three about having difficult conversations. And today I want to do something a little different. I want to tell you about a bill that was just introduced in Congress. In fact, it was the first bill, this new session, this new year, 2021. It's H.R. 1 for the People Act. And what's so scary and frightening about this piece of legislation is that it will stop us from having difficult conversations in the pro-life movement. And, you know, I know many of our listeners may not call themselves conservatives or may not call themselves Republicans, but this is something that left and right, you should be concerned about because it will fundamentally, if this bill becomes a law, it will fundamentally transform our constitutional republic or transform our elections and it'll limit groups like Students for Life and basically the entire pro-life movement from speaking out the truth. Uh, uh, and, and really get, bringing cancel culture to home for our supporters, forcing groups like ours to have to list the names of supporters um, and to do what everything they're trying to do to supporters of pro -life, the pro-life movement, what they're doing right now to some Hollywood actresses. So I have an expert on the show today. Hans von Spakowski is an authority on this issue. He's authority on a wide range of issues, including civil rights, civil justice, the First Amendment, immigration, the rule of law. He's currently a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. You probably have seen him on Fox News. Um, he writes about campaign finance restrictions, voter fraud, voter ID enforcement, federal voting rights. I mean, you cannot get more qualified than Hans on this issue. Uh, before joining Heritage in 2008, he served for two years as a member of the Federal Election Commission. Uh, so he knows what he's talking about. So thank you so much for getting on, Hans. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Well, Christian, thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to bring this kind of issue to light. I, th I don't think a lot of people have been focusing on it. And I think, honestly, I think the Democrats don't want people to, to know what's in this bill. Uh, but I think the pro-life movement particularly needs to be extremely concerned. This is not just like, oh, sometimes I hear in the pro-life movement from folks of like, well, we just need to stay in our lane. Let's not talk about these other issues that happen in Washington, D.C. And that's what hurts us. But this bill, if this bill becomes law, it's going to hurt all of us dramatically, you know, redefine what we can even say as pro-lifers. So can you give us a rundown of what is in this bill, the For the People Act or For the Powerful People Act, um, what it is, what's in it and what what is it going to do? Uh, have we got a couple of hours for this, Kristen? <laughs> <laughs> this is a monstrosity of a bill. It's uh, 800 pages. And I have to tell you, I've been in Washington now for 20 years. It is the worst bill and, frankly, one of the most dangerous bills I think I've ever mm -hmm. seen uh, in, in my entire time here. And it's, it's very complicated. It covers a lot of areas. But let me just kind of summarize very quickly uh, what it does and why it's so dangerous. First of all, it is a federal takeover of the administration of elections. I, I think folks know that, that in this country, states uh, run the election process. They run voter registration. And and running polls and election days, everything. This statute would take that over because it, it, uh, it would implement all of these mandates, prohibitions and bans on the states. Uh, basically take what happened in the election last year, some of the worst things, and this would implement them into law and then make things even worse. I mean, you just give you a couple of quick examples. Um, Look, a number of states have done the smart thing and have put in voter ID laws. You know, that's just common sense. You should you should have to authenticate your identity when you go to vote. Those laws would be uh, voided and out the window. No state is allowed under this federal bill to enforce a voter ID requirement. Second, look, with absentee ballots, you know, absentee ballots are the most vulnerable ballots to everything from mistakes made by voters so that the ballots are rejected mm -hmm. to potential fraud. Uh, a lot of states have a witness signature requirement. In other words, you, you have to have a witness who, who uh, can attest that, yeah, it was the voter who filled out the ballot and signed it. Witness signature requirements out the window. No state would be allowed to enforce a witness signature requirement. 
there's also uh, all these um, restrictions put in to make it as difficult as possible for states to clean up their voter rolls, to maintain the accuracy of their rolls, to find out, for example, if individuals have moved to other states and registered there. That's very important because you don't want people, for example, registering in two different states and illegally casting votes in two different states, which unfortunately does happen. Uh, there's a whole series of other requirements, all of which are, are, are really bad. But then the bill goes into all of these changes in federal campaign finance laws. Now, people listening to this are going to say, well, that doesn't affect me. But in fact, it does. <laughs> and there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, remember, nonprofit organizations, particularly the pro-life area, what is it that you do? You do grassroots work particularly when there are bills in Congress that, that affect abortion. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of activity, that's not campaign activity. You know, when, when you are urging people, for example, to call a particular senator or a particular member of the House to vote for or against a bill that affects abortion, that you're, you're not running a campaign, but under a new definition in this law, if you name a federal candidate, or a federal elected official in a communication that is now a campaign related expense. And what that means is that uh, the nonprofit that's doing that is now suddenly subject to all of the disclosure and filing requirements of the Federal Election Commission that normally applies simply to candidates and political action committees, mm -hmm. which is onerous and burdensome. And Smaller organizations who don't have the money to hire an expensive Washington lawyer to take care of their FEC compliance work, they're not going to be able to comply with that. Uh, furthermore, it has all these requirements for the nonprofits to disclose their donors. And you, we all know why that is. The whole reason for that is because they want the ability for those names to be out there so that those people can be harassed and intimidated and so they won't contribute to the organizations they don't like. Uh, finally, uh, remember what Lois Lerner of the IRS was doing? Remember, mm -hmm. during the Obama administration, um, she was refusing to grant tax-exempt status to conservative mm -hmm. organizations or delaying it because she didn't like the political uh, policy positions they were taking, mm -hmm. particularly when they were doing things like opposing uh, Obamacare. This law makes that legal. It specifically allows the IRS, when it is uh, deciding whether to grant uh, uh, nonprofit tax exempt status to organizations to look at their political and policy positions. Uh, it is it is really an outrageous bill uh, and, and just very, very dangerous. OK, so there's a lot. Yeah. So I'm from West Virginia and my senior thesis in college was on voter fraud because voter fraud happens and yeah. has a, we have a history in the state of West Virginia, voter fraud, just like, you know, in the city of Chicago, how ballots show up, you know, in the right. middle of night. Um, so. The voter ID, I, I just want to make this very clear because I think sometimes we have a lot of students who listen into this podcast and who hear the talking points of the Democratic Party and the left. Right. Right. And they make these arguments that voter ID laws are unfair to undocumented folks who shouldn't be voting <laughs> because they're not citizens of our country. I'm right. sorry, that's that's the truth. Uh, but it's unfair. And it's somehow just it's just mean to people that they have to have an ID when they go to vote. Um, but an ID can ensure that when you show up to vote the day you vote, that you, what your name that you're giving the poll worker matches the name on the ID. I mean, that right. is just like common sense because if not anyone could walk in and say oh yeah here i'm voting you know i can name my mom's name and walk into her voting you know poll poll place and just go ahead and vote like there's just no um way to ensure that people will not go and vote on and then what happens if somebody comes to vote you know so, say if somebody showed up in my polling precinct and they said oh yeah somebody already came to vote for you what do you do then how do you you know it that's no, it, there's nothing there's nothing you could do about that. 
Yeah, because there, it's not like they're recording the, the first Kristen right. Hawkins that came to vote and how she voted. But when I, you know, what, oh my gosh, it's that. So can you help us with when you're having yeah. a conversation in class with your professor and your professor says these voter ID laws, they're keeping the man down. They're, they're so harmful to vulnerable peoples. Can you can you give us some talking points of why voter ID laws make sense? Well, first of all, uh, you need to understand that polling shows consistently that Americans overwhelmingly support uh, an ID requirement and think it's just common sense. A majority of whites, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, a majority of Republicans, Democrats, and independents all see no problem with that. And you mm -hmm. know why? It's because unlike the elitists, like these professors in these ivory tower institutions, uh, ordinary everyday Americans, blue collar folks, uh, middle class folks, we have to show an ID every day constantly. Mm -hmm. Everything from sometimes at the farm at the pharmacies we attend to, to the doctor's offices we go to, to cashing a check, uh, for those who still do that, to buying a beer. And uh, the second thing about this for people to understand is that um, every state that has put in an ID requirement has put in a provision providing a free ID to anyone who doesn't already have one. Uh, these laws have now been in place in a number of states like Georgia and Indiana for more than a decade. So we have actual turnout data mm. to examine. And the turnout data shows very clearly that voter ID laws do not suppress anyone's vote, do not prevent people from voting. And again, the reason for that is that Americans, no matter their race or ethnicity, overwhelmingly already have an ID. It, mm. it, in most, you know, we don't have a national ID. Mm. The substitute ID for just about everybody is a driver's license. And if you look at the numbers on driver's licenses, uh, upwards of 95, 96, 97, 98 percent, depending on the state you're in, of, of, of eligible voters all already have a driver's license. Mm -hmm. Every state that's put one of these in, um, the number of people who have then come in to get the free ID because they don't already have one has been tiny. And so we know that it is not a problem. Actually, that attitude is a frankly patronizingly racist attitude. Hmm. Because what these professors are saying uh, in, in many of these places is that uh, African Americans and Hispanics and others like that uh, just aren't smart enough to get an ID, which is one of the most patronizingly racist things I can imagine, and has proven to be untrue. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I hope that helps and informs some of the conversations I know you all will be having about this uh, law and uh, proposed law, because we're going to be talking about this a lot at Students for Life, and you're going to see more and more coming out about this. Uh, another interesting thing I saw on the elections front, how this federalizes the elections and takes away all the state rights, um, it forces same-day voter registration. Yes. Um, how, that to me just sounds like how, how I mean, how do you just you just walk up to a precinct and be like, hey, I live here. I like to vote. And they say, sure. And yeah, you no, don't even need to show an ID. How is it like? <laughs> no, that's exactly that's exactly right. Look, the problem with same day registration. And again, this is just common sense. Look, the reason most states require you to register 10 days or 20 days at the maximum mm -hmm. 30 days before an election is because if you register immediately and vote which is same day registration, which is what this federal law would require, election officials have no opportunity whatsoever to verify the information you're giving them. Combine that with the fact that this law outlaws voter ID. As you realize, that means that if I wanted to, I could go into any county I wanted to in West Virginia or elsewhere, and I could go, I could spend election day going from yeah. polling place to polling place, to polling place, uh, saying, hey, I'm John Smith. I live at this address. Give me a ballot, and I get to vote. Then I go to the next polling place. Hey, I'm John Jones. I live at this address. I give it a ballot, and I vote. There's no way to prevent that if you have same-day registration and you're not allowed to ask for an ID. It's an invitation to fraud. Yeah. 
I mean, you have that coupled with the, the, the statutes in this bill about mandated early voting. I think it's like 15 days yeah. of early voting. These boxes that they're going to require every state to have these boxes for, for folks to drop off the early ballots. I mean, why? how does this matter to the pro-life movement, guys? Is because Planned Parenthood is one of the most powerful lobbyists in Washington, D.C. They spent more than $45 million dollars that that we know about in this past presidential cycle they work hand in hand with the liberal democratic establishment to galvanize as many people and to get as many ballots as humanly possible into vulnerable precincts and targeted precincts and Planned Parenthood does this with all of the other, you know, liberal activist groups out there. They all work together to to do this. And you can see, like in Pennsylvania, where I live now, the counties, you know, surrounding Philadelphia, who is historically were kind of red, little purple, that went like, like hardcore blue. Um, they were focusing on those counties and those precincts the entire election cycle. And Planned Parenthood is working with them. So anything like this, I mean, it, it's it's a, a, unbelievable. I know we've had people. I remember one time an elected official um, from Arizona actually, I think, went into a Planned Parenthood and was shocked because when he went in, they had voter registration forms right there when women were checking in uh, for their health care clinic. Uh, appointment. So that is how tied in Planned Parenthood is to this entire process. Why? And once we've talked about the Planned Parenthood cycle, they rely on politicians to give them more and more money. They're going to receive, you know, over a half of a billion dollars this year from taxpayer funds. And the more politicians they elect, the more uh, leadership roles uh, that their, you know, champions hold, the more money Planned Parenthood gets. And we all know the more money Planned Parenthood gets, the more babies they kill. So this that is the cycle for you and why you should care about this law and what it does just with our elections. Now, let's go to some of the outrageous things you brought up about nonprofits and how we can, if, if HR1, the For the Powerful People Act passes, what it will do to groups like Students for Life. So if you're an independent, just human being, and you, know, you call your elected official are you going to still be able to do that? Because they're trying to make it more difficult. It sounds like they just don't want anyone to know what they're doing and call them, you know, on what they're doing. Are you going to have to register as a lobbyist if you're just just an ordinary citizen? No, but remember, the whole purpose of nonprofit organizations, nonprofit associations like Students for Life is, uh, look, if you're a multi, multi millionaire like Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, you can spend a heck of a lot of money trying to influence members of Congress mm -hmm. to vote a particular way. If you're an ordinary person like you and me, you know, we don't have the money to do that individually. The whole point of associations, member associations, is by joining together mm -hmm. in an organization that shares your view, you are multiplying your voice. It's a way for ordinary folks like us to join an association that will push the views we have on issues, particularly in this case, on, on mm -hmm. abortion. Uh, and this bill is aimed at nonprofit associations like Students for Life to make it much more di difficult for them to uh, engage in this because they're now going to say that the kind of activity you're engaging in, that's actually campaign activity and therefore we can regulate it. Mm. And, and starting a PAC is not like, you're right, it's not an easy thing. We have a 501c3 at Students for Life. We have a 501c4 Students for Life action. And we're going to be launching a PAC this year. But it, it it's going to take money, time. Got to have a couple of different attorneys working with us on the different PACs. I mean, it's not, I mean, we're and we're a 15-year-old organ, 15 year old organization. And I've delayed it right. this long because it's so cumbersome. And the reporting and, and all of the staff time that takes that takes to get do that. So it's going to limit all of our organizations to be able to speak out. Um, and I thought that was interesting. If you just mention an elected official's name, 
it right. automatically becomes a campaign. And then if you, as a student leader, are thinking about starting your own pro-life nonprofit, and I know many of you are, whether it's a pregnancy center or a local coalition uh, in your community, now you're going to have a hard time getting that 501c3 nonprofit status applied to your group because the IRS is going to be able to look at your mission statement. And right. the you know IRS agent doesn't like what your mission statement is. They can hold up the process, which means you will have to pay taxes, uh, which is it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. And you won't get the nonprofit postage rate, which that's how many nonprofits fundraise is using, you know, direct mail, sending out mail to supporters. And that's very expensive, but it can be a lot cheaper if you use nonprofit postage. So it, it actually goes into like a lot of different things. I think a lot of people are like, well, maybe we should just have all, you know, get rid of nonprofits and, you know, and think about the cost that's associated with those things. Um, so that, that is absolutely shocking. Um, and it just sounds like, I don't know. It, to me, Hans, it sounds like they rolled all these terrible ideas. It's kind of like Obamacare. They just rolled all these terrible ideas into one bill, yes. and it's a monstrosity, and they're hoping no one reads it. And no, they gave it a good that, name. No, no, that's exactly it. Oh, and by the way, did I, did I mention the fact that on these uh, communications or ads that they consider to be a political ad, uh, you're going to have to list your top five donors to your organization? You're going to have to disclose that? <laughs> Can you, can you imagine? Listen, let me tell you what this is, oh my Chris. Uh, let me tell you what this is. You remember the 1950s? There was a big case that ended up before the U.S. Supreme Court, NAACP versus Alabama. Alabama was very upset over what the NAACP was doing, the civil rights movement. So they passed a law that would require the NAACP as a nonprofit to, do guess what? Disclose their donors. Now, the whole reason for that was that if the donors were disclosed, then... Uh, those donors could be harassed, they could be intimidated, mm -hmm. they, they hopefully would quit giving to the NAACP. NAACP sued, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court said, you can't do that. It violates the right of association and, mm -hmm. and the First Amendment. This is the modern version of what Alabama tried to do to the NAACP in the 1950s, uh, except now it's going to be federal law and what's happening will be done by the Federal Election Commission, where I used to be a commissioner. That's absolutely unbelievable. And, I mean, we saw this a couple of years ago with Prop 8 in California. So it was yes. the gay marriage ban right. when suddenly all these donors got disclosed. I remember uh, I still – I just recently stopped using Firefox. And everyone on my staff told me I had to stop using Firefox and switch to Google Chrome. And I am. But – I was using, I remember because the CEO of Firefox was right. outed as like a conservative because of, and he actually had to resign. He lost his job. I don't even know if he's still in Silicon Valley doing his thing because that's what they did. That's what the left does. They will publicly go after supporters and they will try to cancel them. Cancel culture that we see in Hollywood, that you all are seeing on campuses is, you know, will come to all of these nonprofits uh, across the country. And I, I would actually think that those on the, even the left would be concerned about these provisions within the For the Powerful People Act, because, you know, I would think, you know, Planned Parenthood may not want all their big right. do donors named. No, no. In fact, um, if you I don't know if you recall this, but uh, talking about Proposition 8 in California, listen, a left wing group actually took the official disclosure records from the state government and created an app and put it up on the Internet, an app that you could look up the donors who were they believed were on the wrong side of that issue uh, and it would create a map so that you could get to their house. The whole purpose of that was clearly so that uh, those people would uh, have their homes vandalized. Uh, that actually happened. Uh, they, they were vandalized. People had their cars uh, damaged and graffiti was drawn. And the whole point of that was to use that disclosure information to go after individuals who they said were uh, against gay marriage on the Proposition 8 uh, uh, referendum. And didn't that recently just happen in California where there was a case and they just disclosed a bunch of donors by accident? It was it was something where like... Yes. <laughs> and yes, the... Uh, does that involve the, uh, somebody in the federal government today? 
Uh, in fact, that case is now up before the U.S. Supreme Court because of the fact that California, their uh, state AG's office requires the disclosure of donors to the AG, and they then, uh, as you said, accidentally disclosed them to the public, except they've done it on multiple occasions. You know, once mm -hmm. or twice, you might think it's an accident, but when it starts happening numerous times, uh, you get the feeling that somebody inside the bureaucracy is probably doing that deliberately. So is this when Kamala Harris was attorney general or Javier Becerra, who's being nominated for HHS secretary, was attorney general? Uh, Kamala Harris started oh, this great. and it continued oh, under great. Becerra. Yeah. So just, just, just connecting the dots for everybody here so they can see the dots. All right. So I guess the question is everyone's hopefully as outraged as I am and is equally concerned. Uh, I know many of you who are listening in as Students for Life leaders, you've already started to see cancel culture come home to roost on your campus with your social media. We've had several Students for Life groups just in the past couple of weeks suddenly have their accounts disbanded or blocked for no apparent reason. And we're very concerned about this at Students for Life. Um, but what can folks do now? So. This bill hasn't been passed yet. It passed right. in the last Congress, but thanks to then the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, uh, he kind of, I think, laughed it off stage and didn't have a shot. Now the Democrats, the pro-abortion Democrats, control the U.S. Senate. Uh, and I've, has have they committed to voting on this when it passes the House? I'm sure they uh, have. I, I'm sure they, ha they, they will, because in fact, uh, Chuck Schumer has introduced the Senate version of this bill, it's S-1. So it's H.R. 1 on the House side and it's S-1 okay. on the Senate side. The key to stopping this is going to be maintaining the filibuster in the Senate so okay. that uh, Republicans can filibuster the bill. Uh, and also it's going to be a matter of folks trying to call and persuade, frankly, Democratic senators who perhaps uh, got elected in states that were run by, won by Republicans like Donald Trump and mm -hmm. uh, uh, talk to them to say, you really, you really shouldn't be, look, no matter what you think about what the election law should be, uh, you shouldn't be voting for a bill that's gonna take that power away from our state government, our mm. state legislature to decide what those rules should be in our state. That, that is really the message on, uh, on the election side of this. Okay, so call your US senators, especially if you live in a red, purple state, uh, West Virginia, Joe Manchin has already yes. said that he's a fan of keeping the filibuster. I know our team will be on the ground with Susan B. Anthony List thanking Senator Manchin um, for committing to you know keeping the filibuster. Kristen Cinema, uh, the Democrat uh, senator from Arizona, has said I believe that she's in favor of keeping the filibuster. So we need to get out to her to reaffirm. Uh, keeping the filibuster. But if you live in a state uh, that has, you know, a Democrat senator, but your state's pretty red, make sure you give them a call and tell them to keep the filibuster in the Senate uh, and to vote against S-1 uh, in the Senate, because we know this will likely pass in the House. But the Senate, it sounds like what you're saying, Hans, the place to kill this bill is in the U.S. Senate with the filibuster. Yeah, although I wouldn't totally give up on the House. I mean, it will be a party line vote, but you know, the the, the margin between the Democratic the Democrats and the Republicans in the House is pretty small, <laughs> and it wouldn't take that many votes of Democrats. Again, Democrats who won in a congressional district, but it's a state that uh, uh, voted for. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, it wouldn't, it might not take so that much persuasion to get them to hopefully vote against this bill. So yeah, Senate okay. is the main, the main defense, but I wouldn't give up on the House quite yet either. Okay. So Senate, House, would it do any good for us to be calling our state, I don't know, attorneys general, yes. secretary of states, yes, putting because pressure this, on the Senate? Yeah. The state, state attorney generals and state legislators, I don't care whether they're Democrats or Republicans should all be against this bill and should all be doing their best to persuade their congressional representatives to vote against it. Again, because it mm -hmm. interferes with and takes over what has been a state function since the beginning of the country. Yeah, oh, it's 
unbelievable. All right. Well, this is, I thank you so much for coming on and explaining sure. this to all of us. I think this is a really important conversation to have because it's about all of our future conversations that we need to have in the pro-life movement. And y'all, we know we are not the uh, $2 billion industry that Planned Parenthood is. We have to work together uh, and we have to use our grassroots network. And that's how we've been successful. Uh, and we've made progress in the past 48 years in our fight against legal abortion. Uh, and this bill, the For the Powerful People Act, would directly hinder our ability to do that in the future uh, and harm, I would say, you know, forever our constitutional republic here in the United States of America. So, Hans, how do folks follow you so they can stay up to date and up to speed with everything going on with this bill? Uh, if they go to heritage.org, heritage.org, uh, I'm the only Hans at the Heritage <laughs> website, and they could follow all my writings there, and we have information there about HR1. Plus, we have information there. We just put it out, uh, a list of the kind of fixes that state legislatures need to put in uh, for their elections. It's a, it's a list mm-hmm. of best practices, recommendations on everything from how to keep, keep voter registration lists clean to how absentee ballots should be handled. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And you all know the Heritage Foundation. They were sponsors of the National Pro-Life Summit last year. So we are honored to have them as partners and continue to work so closely with so many of their excellent, excellent team members. So thank you so much, Hans, for your time today. I really appreciate it. Make sure you call your senators, your U.S. congressmen, and your state attorney general and any state legislator you know and tell them we are against the HR1 or S1, uh, the For the People Act, or we call it the For the Powerful People Act. Thanks so much, guys. 